For those of you who are watching this, I owe you an apology. I started creating Aerospace Dimensions chapter overviews in 2020. I started March 4th of 2020. And after July 28th, 2020, I went radio silent when it came to making Aerospace Dimension overview videos. And for that, I am truly sorry. But hey, at least we're doing one. So if you are familiar with the Aerospace Dimensions books, I, I've i got a few of them here. I'm just, I'm gonna show off my collection. Woo! I got the paper copies. I got the paper copies. I also got them about 10 years ago. So I guess these are sort of like collector's things now and I should cherish them and be very careful with them. As I was saying, I am very sorry for neglecting to make more aerospace dimension summary videos. There is another video series out there by Aerospace Education or uh, First Lieutenant Roberts from South Carolina Wing, and I will link some of his videos because he has gone over more than I have. And I suddenly stopped doing them because I was like, oh, I should do a uniform video. Oh, I should do an ES video. Oh, I should do stuff for senior members. And I'm sorry for those of you who have been looking for more stuff on module three, and then I neglected to make them. So the first thing that chapter three, Weather Elements talks about is wind. And if you're not familiar with what wind is, it is a body of air that is in motion. And so the way that we typically measure wind is we measure the direction and we measure the speed. And so if you are familiar with, like if, if you've ever done stuff for flying, typically the weather is given to you in knots. And one knot is one nautical mile per hour or 6,076 feet. So technically a knot equals 1.1 miles per hour. They are not equivalent. But if we think about like miles per hour and how fast a flag might be blowing in the wind, there is a little visual picture in the book. Um, if it's wind calm, then the flag is just gonna be chilling. It's not gonna be doing a whole lot. Um, if it's starting to get more windy, then it'll do a little bit of a blowing in that one direction that the wind is blowing it in. And it'll be like a light blowing. <laughs> and movement. If it's 20, it's, it's going to be quite drastic. And if it's 30 miles per hour, it's just going to be like waving like this, maybe not in two different directions. It would be more like this. So if you are not familiar with the aviation terms, there's upwind when you're first taking off, there's crosswind, downwind, and base, and then final. So when you are taking off, you want to make sure that the wind is going in the opposite direction of your plane because you want it to take off and you want it to take a shorter amount of runway length in order to take off. So if you have to take into account what the wind is, if the wind is going perpendicular to the aircraft, you're typically only going to be able to do 15 knots at maximum because you have to do something called crabbing and you'll have to tilt your plane and you'll have to adjust it so that it still makes it to the runway while it's being pushed away from where you're trying to land because like I'll, I'll give you this view let's say your plane is currently coming down to land and the wind is pushing you this way and our runway is straight directly into the camera right and you're trying to land the wind is going to push you in this direction which means you have to adjust your plane in order to try to land correctly and it can be very challenging it can be very dangerous so that's something that you need to know when you're flying when you look at the wind look at the direction that it's coming from and look at how fast it's going. Because if you're going this direction and the wind is coming straight towards you, it could be going up to maybe like 20 knots and that wouldn't be as big of a problem. You just land earlier. Now it might also be very turbulent in the air. So you need to know your personal limits when you're flying before you go out voyaging into gusting 20 knots or gusting 30 knots. 30 knots is, is actually pretty bad, so I, I would not recommend doing that. But know your personal limitations and also know what the plane's limitations are. There is a little placard in the plane. It's required to be placed in the plane that says the maximum crosswind is, and then it'll say, depending on how stable the aircraft is, depending on how small or big it is, and what, like all of the components of the plane combined, the manufacturer determines what the max crosswind can be. And so they put that into the pilot operating handbook and then the maintainer has to make sure that pilots are aware by having that 
little sticker slash placard in the plane available for them to look at. So the next thing that I will briefly mention that I do want you to person, yes, you to personally look at instead of me going over each of these is the Beaufort scale. You don't necessarily have to memorize it, but it starts with zero, it ends at 12, and it's something that was invented in 1805 and is very commonly used nowadays to just kind of indicate what the wind is like. So if it's a zero on, on a sea or on a body of water, the water's not really going to be moving a whole lot. It's, it's going to be clear, it'll be mirror-like, and it'll be very easy to just see your reflection in it. And if you had like smoke on land, then the smoke would just rise up vertically because the, the smoke is not being adjusted by the wind. And then with 12, if you look at 12, that one is going to be very extreme because it's the highest end of the wind. So you've got a lot of foam, you've got a lot of disturbances with the water, and if it's on land, then it's just kind of like destruction. So you can think of like a hurricane or t tornado level winds. That's getting closer to the, the, the 12 end on our Beaufort scale. But this is something that you should honestly look at yourself just to get a better bearing of the in-betweens of how do we get from step zero, which is perfectly calm like conditions where the water is clear and mirror like to mass destruction. The next thing briefly mentioned is wind chill. So typically when you hear a forecast, you hear the temperature outside is currently 64 degrees Fahrenheit, but it feels like 55. And the reason why is because when there is wind involved with the equation, the wind is taking the heat away from your body. And so if you don't have wind, you remember that, that whole Beaufort scale thing where it's like zero, you've just got the, the smoke going straight up. If you don't have any wind and it's very calm, then your body temperature is not as affected than when the wind is super high because your clothes maintain that heat and you just get all that solar radiation coming in from the sun and it's not being blown off of you. And the reason why in winter weather you wear lots of layers is because you are trying to reflect the heat back towards your body. So when there's wind, something that's really useful for you to use when like the wind chill could be going super duper high where like it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside but it feels like negative nine, that's when you need to make sure you've got layers that prevent the wind from getting through your clothes and pulling that heat away from you. Because the heat, it's not gonna do anything for the environment and you wanna maintain that internal temperature and have all that heat reflected back at you rather than into the environment. And an another quick note, they have a very nice diagram here of what the wind chill is. So it, it says like the miles per hour of the wind and the temperature and then how cold it actually makes it feel because that, that's a, it's good information to know and understand. Let's briefly talk about microbursts. Microbursts are whenever there is a significant unstable part of the air that is creating this huge downdraft. And this can be especially dangerous when pilots are taking off and landing. Let's say you have a cumulus cloud here and it's got the downdraft. Once it hits the ground, it'll spread out horizontally and that can be especially dangerous for pilots because if you're trying to take off and you suddenly get slammed into the ground, well, you have no control there. That's the weather. So whenever you are preparing to fly or if you are doing an orientation ride with a pilot, they check the weather and they will look at different weather maps that indicate where potential storm systems are. Because if there's a storm system, the chance of microbursts is extremely high and you want to avoid lightning, microbursts, and very low visibility conditions. Whenever we do orientation rides, we want to make sure it's the safest conditions possible for cadets to enjoy and not feel like they're going to get motion sick or that like it's, it's supposed to be a good experience for everyone. So in order to reduce the stress and to provide positive experiences, we try to be as safe as we can. And so we do require BFR or visual flight rule conditions. And when pilots are taking off or landing during potentially storming conditions, they, they could have pretty low clouds, which we, we do not allow for orientation rides. Heat is the total energy of molecules within a substance. So let's take a pot of boiling water. If you think of boiling water, you see the bubbles are all going like blah, 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 blah. 
which is a good re visual representation of the heat being so high. Because the reason why the heat is so high is because you are transferring energy from your stove to the water and the, the pot that's holding that water. And those molecules start to get faster and they're moving around, they're bouncing around. And you'll even start to see steam and the evaporation of the water because it's just so hot and it's getting to the point where it will actually start turning into a gaseous state rather than being in its liquid form. And so because they're moving so quickly, it, there becomes more space and you can actually see the water level rising when you're using boiling water. And they're just spreading out and they're moving more quickly everywhere. And so heat is that total energy of molecules moving around in the substance. So if you take like an ice cube versus a pot of boiling water, the heat is clearly greater in the pot than the ice cube. That leads us into our next concept, which is conduction. So let's say that stovetop. You've got a really hot surface, it's touching the pot and it's heating up the water. That is called conduction. The next one is convection, which is the movement of heat in a vertical direction. And air over hot surfaces rises faster than on surfaces that are not. Advection is the lateral transfer of heat and radiation is from the sky. So there's conduction, convection, advection, and the radiation it, that that's just how i remembered it and the, the shorter version is conduction advection radiation but you you gotta have convection in there too so you gotta have it awkwardly be like conduction convection advection radiation so just as a quick summary remember conduction is the surface is touching each other, so like that stove top, and then we've got convection, so like the heat rising off of a hot summer day's piece of con- well, asphalt, let's do asphalt because that's darker colored and it typically gets more heat, but that asphalt is hot because of the radiation from the sun. And then advection, which is the lateral transfer of heat, it, it can be exemplified by like wind blowing on a surface. There are three different systems of temperature to be aware of, which are Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. For Fahrenheit, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. For Celsius, the freezing point of water is 0 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. For Kelvin, the freezing point is 273 degrees Kelvin, and the boiling point is 373 degrees Kelvin. But Kelvin is typically used for scientific purposes, so if you're doing something in chemistry or biology, probably more chemistry than biology, but if you're doing some kind of lab, then you'll probably be asked to convert the temperature from either Celsius or Fahrenheit into Kelvin, or vice versa, where you're given an example and you have to convert it into Fahrenheit or Celsius. So there are a few different ways that you can just easily calculate between Fahrenheit and Celsius, but the one that I typically use is Fahrenheit equals parenthesis Celsius times 1.8 and parenthesis plus 32. And that, whether you have the Fahrenheit or Celsius, you can determine which is on which side. You, like you, you could determine where Celsius just on the one side by itself and have Fahrenheit. But if you have Fahrenheit and you need to transfer into Celsius, then that's the way you can do it too. Typically when you are flying, they use Celsius for just standardization across all of aviation. Remember earlier when I was talking about the molecules moving very, very quickly and how they were spreading apart when they were becoming gaseous in that boiling pot of water and that steam? So that kind of leads me into the next point of pressure. Pressure on Earth, we, I've already talked about the composition of our atmosphere, but let's talk a little bit about pressure. So the molecules that are closer to like the center of the Earth and closer to the ground are more closely compact together. And as you get further and further away from the surface, they start to spread out. 
If you think of when you've flown in a plane, sometimes you can feel pressure in your ears or in your sinuses in your face, and that's because of the change in altitude. That's the change in pressure that you're experiencing. And something that when you're checking the weather when you're flying, you check the pressure altitude because that can actually adjust what your altimeter is saying. And you'll adjust it so that the pressure that the area has matches what your plane's instrument says. In order to measure air pressure, you use something called a barometer. And you could use an aneroid barometer or you could use a mercury barometer. The mercury one, it does take longer in order to get a read, but it is more accurate and stable versus the aneroid, which is faster, but it isn't necessarily as accurate or stable. So, hoo oh, oh boy, at the end of this chapter, you could go ahead and take a look. We do have quite a bit of information here on different activities that you can do, like converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit. And if you're not doing that in school and if you haven't done it before, it's a really great practice because if you are gonna be a pilot and you get the temperature, let's say you get the temperature is um, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, can you quickly do that mental math and converting it from Fahrenheit to Celsius to know if it's a good temperature outside to go for a walk? I don't know. It, it's a good practice and like if you do go abroad to other countries that don't use Fahrenheit, it's also very useful for understanding their weather reports. There's also a really cool activity here. It's on making a homemade thermometer. So if you want to check that out, please do. But guys, that is all for my Aerospace Dimensions Chapter 3 video on Module 3. I'm sorry it took so long to put out, but here it is. It's a resource for you and I hope it was useful. So thank you so much for watching. And that is all, folks. Until next time. Toodles.